Item Number SCP-105 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-105 is implanted with a tracking device and is currently housed at Site-17. SCP-105 is currently allowed Class 3 Restricted Socialization Privileges with approved Site Personnel, granted based on continued good behavior and cooperation with Foundation personnel. SCP-105's personal camera, designated SCP-105-B, is contained in a locked safe deposit box at Site-19's High Value Item Storage Facility. Standard positive action defenses, explosive, chemical, biological, and mimetic, are to be in place at all times, while SCP-105-B is within containment. SCP-105 and SCP-105-B, or any other camera, are only to be allowed to come into contact with approval of the current managing researcher. Description: SCP-105, formerly known as Iris Thompson, is a female human of European descent. Records indicate that SCP-105 was born in making her years old at the time of acquisition. She has blonde hair and blue eyes, and at the time of this article, is 1.54 meters in height and 50 kilograms in weight. She does not appear to have any out of the ordinary physical characteristics, and appears to be, for all intents and purposes, a normal human being in good health. SCP-105-B is a Polaroid one-step express camera, manufactured in 1982. SCP-105-B does not appear to have any out of the ordinary physical characteristics, and appears to be, for all intents and purposes, a normal Polaroid camera, operating normally for all persons aside from SCP-105. When SCP-105 holds a photograph taken by SCP-105-B, the photograph changes from a still image to that of a real-time image of the location in question. SCP-105 is also able to reach through the photograph and manipulate objects within reach of the original point at which the photograph was taken. Persons witnessing this manipulation report seeing a disembodied female hand, determined to be that of SCP-105, reaching out from an invisible portal and carrying out the actions indicated. SCP-105-B and the photographs taken by said camera have no unusual properties when used by any other person. SCP-105 has demonstrated limited ability to manipulate objects through other photographs, but can only achieve fine control using photographs taken through SCP-105-B. So far, SCP-105 has only been able to significantly advance her ability by using photographs taken by SCP-105-B. Appendix 1 Circumstances of Acquisition SCP-105 was brought to the Foundation's attention shortly after the murder of her boyfriend. SCP-105 claimed to have been on the phone with the victim at the time of his murder, prompting her to hurry to his side. However, telephone records did not correspond to her story, making her suspect in the murder. SCP-105 informed her lawyer that she had, in fact, witnessed the murder through a photograph she had taken with her boyfriend several days prior. The attorney in question disregarded the story and recommended that the subject plead guilty. Subject refused to do so and subsequently told her story in court, offering to demonstrate her ability. This led to Foundation contact. Subject was immediately contained by the Foundation. Foundation personnel retrieved SCP-105-B from SCP-105's home, replacing it with an identical model, and returned it to her. SCP-105's parents were informed that she was killed during the botched escape of another patient, while both were in custody of a psychiatric care facility. Appendix 2 Excerpt from Interview Log 105-08-4426 Begin Log Doctor, please give a brief personal introduction, including date and place of birth, and your name. SCP-105 Okay. My name is Iris Thompson. I was born in Phoenix, Arizona on May 12th. Doctor Good. First question, when did you become aware of your abilities? SCP-105 I'm not sure, but I think I was either 10 or 11. I remember because I was looking at a picture of the ocean, and I noticed that the waves began moving. Doctor, how did your parents respond when you told them? SCP-105 They just said that I had an overactive imagination. Doctor when did you discover that you were able to manipulate objects through a photograph? SCP-105 
It first happened when I was 11, 12 maybe. My family took a trip to the Grand Canyon. I looked through the photo album after we got home and brushed my hand up against one by accident. When I did, I pushed a rock over the edge, falling into the canyon. I could actually hear it clatter on the way down. Doctor, go on. SCP-105. I became fascinated with photography after that. Most of the time, it didn't work with photographs I took, but my parents got me a Polaroid One Step Express camera. I'd been begging for them to get it since Christmas. SCP-105 starts smiling. After I got the camera, the photos got easier to interact with. Doctor, this is the camera we refer to as 105B, your personal camera. SCP-105, yes sir. Doctor, how many photos can you focus on at one time? SCP-105, I've gotten up to 10 at once with my personal camera, but I'm sure I could do more eventually. Doctor, what is your impression of your time with the Foundation so far? SCP-105 remains silent. Doctor, please do answer. We don't take offense at these things. SCP-105, it's sort of like new prison, new warden but I know it's better than what could have happened to me. Doctor, you've been very cooperative during your time here. SCP-105, I'm a pretty well-behaved sort of person. I also like doing the experiments. Some of those things with photographs I never would have thought of. Doctor, do you know why I'm asking you these questions, Iris? SCP-105, no, sir. Doctor, we've been setting up a special program. If it goes through, you'll be occasionally allowed to leave the site and move about in the outside world. All we ask of you in return are a few favors. Are you interested? End log. Addendum 3. History of service with Mobile Task Force Omega-7. SCP-105 was the second humanoid SCP recruited to Mobile Task Force Omega-7 under the Pandora's Box initiative. Unlike Team Able, associated with SCP-076-2, which was assigned to strike and capture operations. Team Iris had the primary mission of reconnaissance and intelligence gathering. Team Iris carried out over 20 missions in cooperation with the Bowie Commission. These missions were carried out swiftly and without incident. The first disciplinary incident involving SCP-105 involved the escalation of Team Iris missions from reconnaissance to wet work. SCP-105 violently opposed the use of her abilities to carry out assassinations even after members of the Bowie Commission repeatedly attempted to secure her cooperation. During these events, SCP-105 became emotionally distressed and attempted to deceive Foundation personnel into believing that her anomalous traits had disappeared. Dr. D submitted a report recommending that SCP-105 be reclassified as neutralized, undergo amnestic treatment, and be released to the public with regular monitoring. This recommendation was denied. Following this, Dr. D aided SCP-105 in a containment breach, aiming to escape Foundation custody. This breach was unsuccessful, and SCP-105 was recontained. Investigation afterwards determined that Dr. D had intentionally encouraged SCP-105 to claim loss of anomalous abilities. SCP-105 re-demonstrated her anomalous abilities in exchange for restoration of limited privileges. Following the end of the Pandora's Box initiative, all Mobile Task Force Omega-7 teams were disbanded, and SCP-105 was returned to Site-17. Because of the security risk she represents and lack of current utility, SCP-105 is presently not allowed access to SCP-105-B. All further information regarding Mobile Task Force Omega-7 is sealed by order of the Records and Information Security Administration. Director. Records and Information Security Administration Addendum 4 Special Notice Regarding Current Containment Status Many formal and informal reports have been made regarding SCP-105 and a supposed connection to Mobile Task Force Alpha-9. These reports constitute a serious breach of security. All information regarding Mobile Task Force Alpha-9 is restricted. All information regarding current research on anomalous characteristics of SCP-105 is restricted. All reports or rumors regarding any current or recent use of SCP-105 as a Foundation asset are to be considered categorically false.
and should be reported to the Records and Information Security Administration. Director Records and Information Security Administration. Item number SCP-223. Object Class Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-223 is kept in a locked containment vault in Site-19. If the two photos missing from SCP-223 are recovered, they should be stored in two separate specially prepared vaults at Site-17. Any personnel who see any anomalies appear anywhere in SCP-223 must be reassigned to another project immediately. Such personnel must be kept under observation for mental instability including tri-weekly examination by a site psychiatrist, and are advised to minimize their exposure to photographs of any kind. Description: SCP-223 is a photo album, capable of holding 30 photos, bound like a small hardcover book. The photos are attached to the pages with an unknown adhesive. It matches the appearance of a product made by but lacks any brand. From Danny with Love has been written on the back in blue ink. SCP-223 contains 28 photos, which chronicle an engaged couple's vacation to beach. The final two pages of the album have been ripped out. The couple in the photos has been positively identified as E and L, who went on the vacation depicted June of 19 E and L died on June in a murder-suicide by E. E's suicide note claimed he found his fiance in bed with another man and killed her. However, no evidence of such an affair was ever found. There is one other person who frequently appears in the photos of SCP-223, a Caucasian male with attractive and somewhat androgynous features. Designation SCP-2231 Based on his behavior in the photos, he seems to be a friend of the couple. All attempts to determine the identity of SCP-2231 have proven fruitless. SCP-2231 does not appear in photos and recorded footage of SCP-223, although careful comparative analysis of the photos and data expunged. Occasionally, persons reading SCP-223 will see the likeness of their romantic interest in one or more of SCP-223's photos, replacing an incidental bystander. Independent observers can verify that the photos do in fact change. However, these anomalies are always discovered by the individual they most concern. SCP-223 seems to target readers who are in a stable, happy, romantic relationship with these anomalies. SCP-223 apparently can only target one person at a time in this way. If the discoverer of the anomaly, hereafter, the target, continues to read SCP-223, their perceptions of the album's contents will change radically. While any other reader continues to see the original photos, the target will see an album of photos of their romantic partner interacting with an androgynous but attractive member of the target's sex. The target invariably reacts with jealousy and suspicion, and if allowed will search for the final two pages, believing that the contents will prove whether or not the target's partner is cheating. The effects of SCP-223 on a given target wear off completely within one week unless the target is exposed to new photos, or SCP-223. At this point, the current target's love interest's likeness will vanish from the album, and the target can safely view ordinary photographs. A former target attempting to view SCP-223's photographs will see If not allowed contact with SCP-223 following the initial discovery, the target's perceptions of other photographs will also be altered. The nature of these alterations varies depending on the content of the photos, but the majority involve the inclusion of a humanoid, similar to SCP-2231. Pictures including both the target and the target's romantic partner seem to be the most psychologically damaging to view. Exposure to a sufficiently large number of photographs seems to cause a brainwashing effect in the target, creating a strong delusion of great danger that can only be resolved by returning the missing photos to SCP-223. This appears to be caused by a long succession of subliminal signals and traumatizing images, rather than by any actual psychic influence. Psych Report 223-6 Dr. Morris Interview Log Examiner Please be seated. How long has it been since your first exposure? Morris Um, about a week? Yeah, that's right, seven days. It's all kind of blurred. 
Examiner, how do you feel? Morris, sort of paranoid, edgy, like he's watching me from somewhere, somehow. Um, any update on the missing photos? Examiner, who do you mean by he? Morris, the man we call 2231, from the photos, he's... Examiner, yes? Morris, silence. Examiner, have you been exposed to any photos since your last visit? Morris, no. Examiner, good. What do you see here? Photo is of a grizzly bear drinking from a pool. Morris, um, it seems to be a photo of two bears mating. Examiner, very well. And this? Photo is of a bed, no figures present. Morris, a naked man seated on a bed. Look, it's been a week, right? You can let me go? I've got to find those photos. Examiner, you seem extremely interested in SCP-223's missing photographs. Why? Morris, I've got to prove Lily's innocence. Examiner, Dr. Morris, your wife is in no danger. We discovered nearly 20 photographs hidden in and around your quarters, Dr. Morris. Whatever you saw in those photos is not real. Morris, lunging at the examiner, restrained by guards. Liar! You're working for them, aren't you? Examiner, to guards. Take him away for now. Morris, wait, wait! When can I see Lily again? Log ends. Note. Morris was given a Class A amnestic and has now returned to his full duties. Mrs. Morris has been informed that her husband is dead. Addendum 2231. Further analysis of E's autopsy report indicates that several of the wounds found on his body could not have been self-inflicted. Therefore, suicide has been ruled out as a cause of death. There is no evidence of anyone other than E entering or leaving the scene of the crime for at least 24 hours before and after his death. Although, one of the walls. Item number, SCP-228. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-228 will be used to conduct experimental psychiatric testing at Site-23. SCP-228 is to be kept under glass in Observation Room 113 ADC at Site-23. Access to Observation Room 113 ADC will require either Level 4 authorization or a signed notification from Medical Director Light. Observation Room 113 ADC is to be monitored by no fewer than four high-definition video cameras and a reinforced one-way observation mirror running the full length of the east wall. When a subject observes SCP-228, the reaction is to be documented by no fewer than five researchers stationed behind the observation mirror, as well as the subject's accompanying psychiatrist. Description: SCP-228 is a Polaroid photograph of variable appearance. It is apparent at this time that SCP-228 derives its subject matter from the subconscious mind of the viewer. The images produced are always visually clear, but vary in interpretive coherency. For example, one viewer may cause SCP-228 to manifest a clear portrait of that viewer's father, while another causes an image of a heart-shaped object, submerged in green fluid to The coherence of the image produced by SCP-228 appears to vary from subject to subject, and is theorized to have some connection to the viewer's emotional state. SCP-228's various image manifestations can be photographed normally, although the photographs will not display the ability to manifest new images. It will manifest an image when viewed remotely by video feed. After SCP-228 has manifested an image, it will remain inert, displaying the same image until that viewer looks away. At that point, it will adapt its manifestation to reflect that of the current viewer. The question of what SCP-228 manifests when unobserved is moot. SCP-228 will be used to assist members of the psychiatric staff at Site-23. During psychoanalysis, the patient, hereafter referred to as the subject, will be asked leading questions and instructed to look at SCP-228. Once the manifestation has been recorded, the subject will be instructed to look away. At no point should the interviewer view SCP-228 before the subject, 
as this will corrupt the record and potentially skew psychoanalysis of the subject. Addendum. As of no personnel who have previously been exposed to a visual mimetic agent is authorized for exposure to SCP-228 due to the possibility of subsequent data expunged. Item number SCP-404 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-404 is to be kept in Section Alpha-1 of the Documents Repository. Any movement of SCP-404 beyond Section Alpha-1 will result in termination. Description SCP-404 is a pair of large manila envelopes, one of which has a series of pages attached to the front. Each page is stamped with a name, date, time, and number table, and contains multiple entries with known and unknown names. The ink has been dated to 1833, plus or minus 10 years, and the folder dated to 1834, plus or minus 10 years. Many signatures are noted on the grid, notably those of former document repository administrators expunged. All signatures also are followed by a numerical reference number. Currently, there are over 1,000 signatures on these pages, with additional pages appearing on their own when the previous ones become full. A count of these pages has proven impossible, as has the contents of the envelope as mentioned later. Contained inside SCP-404 are a series of large 8x10 photographs. Attempts to count the exact numbers of photographs have thus far failed. When a person attempts to count the total photographs, they will invariably get a number wrong at least twice and have to start over. If more than one person attempts to count them, they will begin to debate what number they were at last and start over. If a mechanized system is used to count the photographs, it will either glitch, fail, freeze, or skip, causing a recount to be required. Any person may pick up and access the first envelope, known as SCP-404-A. They may withdraw a single photograph at a time from the envelope. This photo will always be blank when drawn out, and will remain so until five seconds have passed. Should the photo remain in contact with the person who drew it longer than five seconds, it will then begin to fade into an image, in the same way a Polaroid develops. This image will be a crystal clear image from an event in the holder's past, which, thus far, has always been immediately recognized by the holder. Once this photograph has been developed, it will no longer fit into SCP-404-A, no matter what effort is applied to it. This image will fit perfectly into the second envelope, SCP-404-B. An undeveloped photo will not fit into SCP-404-B. After a developed photo is placed inside of SCP-404-B, the pages attached to the front of the envelope will update themselves with the name, date, time, and an incrementing number. If a person picks up SCP-404-B, they immediately know which pages contain lines with their name, although they may not know the numbers. When they have viewed the numbers, or if they already know the number, they are able to draw that photo out of SCP-404-B with only a few seconds of searching. The most disconcerting feature of SCP-404-B is that once the subject has left the presence of the envelopes for longer than an hour, they forget interacting with either envelope, as well as the memory imprinted on the photo. This effect lasts until the subjects re-enter the presence of SCP-404-A or B, at which time they regain their memory of having used the envelopes, but will not remember the event on the photograph until it is viewed again. Researchers who oversee the testing of SCP-404-A or B, but who do not interact with the contents of the envelope, are capable of remembering both the test and the image to the best their natural memory allows. Document number 4041. Subject is Class D personnel who has been instructed to draw five photos from SCP-404-A. First photo drawn contains an image of a young girl on a tire swing, being pushed from behind. Subject confirms that the girl is their younger sister at age six. Second photo contains image of the same girl now older, nude, in a bedroom setting, laying on a bed and smiling, wagging finger at the viewer. Subject confirms once again that this is their sister, and is noted becoming distressed. Third photo drawn contains image of same girl, 
older again, in the garb of high school graduation with her arm around a male of similar age. Subject confirms again this is his sister and the boy is her boyfriend. Subject seems agitated and reluctant to continue until assured he must only draw two more photos. Fourth photo drawn contains image of a car that has gone half off of a road. The windows on all sides are smashed, and the driver door is open. In the driver's seat is the same boy from the previous photo, with no discernible age difference. There is considerable bodily damage on the boy, as well as a slit throat. Subject confirms this is the same boy. Fifth photo drawn shows a funeral setting. The girl from the previous photos is the center of focus. She is wearing a black funeral dress and has a hateful expression. Subject confirms that this is his sister again. All photos drawn will no longer fit into SCP-404-A, so are filed inside of SCP-404-B. Subject's name, current date, and numbers now appear on the topmost sheet of SCP-404-B. After the test had completed, the subject was allowed to leave the testing area and then questioned about the photos. After a time lapse of approximately one hour, subject became unable to answer any further questions about the photos and denied having ever been part of a test for this day. The subject is unable to account for the time spent in the testing chamber and also denies knowledge of ever attending a funeral with his sister for any individual. Up until the time threshold had passed, subject had been willing to answer any and all questions regarding the incident in the photos. Loss of memory attributed to interaction with SCP-404-A and B. Document 404-2 Subject is Dr. who has recently been through an overly dramatic breakup of a relationship. She has volunteered for this test and has been informed of the anticipated results. First photo drawn from SCP-404-A develops into the image of a young man in overalls, leaning against a car and covered in oil stains. Subject confirms this is her ex-boyfriend, and that he was mechanically inclined. Second photo drawn from SCP-404-A shows the same man in a very angry state, postured as if he is striking the viewer. Subject confirms again that this is her ex-boyfriend, and that this event is part of what led to their separation. Third photo drawn from SCP-404-A shows the same man in an amusement park setting, seated on a roller coaster beside the viewer. Subject confirms this was their first date. Fourth photo drawn from SCP-404-A is completely blank. Twice the normal time allowed for a photo to develop passes, and photo remains blank. This photo also is returned to SCP-404-A with no effort, while all other photos must be inserted into SCP-404-B, which now shows the subject's name with three new timestamps and numbers listed on its pages. After the fourth photo was drawn, subject was released and approached three hours later, where she was asked as to the status of her relationship with the boyfriend. Subject denies knowing any such person, or ever having participated in any tests today. Subject is also unable to account for lost time, but shows no concern over the disparity. Document number 4043. Subject for this test is Dr. Dr. was chosen at random with no end result expected. First photo drawn is a first-person perspective of a water paint portrait being drawn. The artist's hands are visible in the photo, and Dr. confirms this is her at age four. Second photo drawn is of an elderly man smiling. Photo perspective suggests the viewer is raised up in the air looking down at the man. Dr. confirms this is her grandfather, who passed away approximately a year and a half later. Third photo is drawn after a brief reprise to allow Dr. to collect herself. This photo shows a funeral service, and the perspective again suggests the viewer is a short individual. Dr. confirms this is her grandfather's funeral service. This photo also shows the elderly man again at the headstone, which is the viewer's point of focus in this photo. The elderly man is marginally out of focus compared to his surroundings, which are crisp and clear. In addition, he is semi-transparent, to a degree of approximately 15%, suggesting that his presence is either a true spectral manifestation or exists only in the mind of the viewer. Dr. requested a copy of this third photo, 
and a digital copy was created for her without incident. The original has been filed into SCP-404-B, and the copy is framed in Dr. R's office. Document number 4044. Subjects for this test are Dr. and Dr. whom have been working together for the past two years. These two doctors were chosen at random from established pairs of staff, who had been working on projects together for over one year. Dr. draws the first photo from SCP-404-A. This photo, when developed, shows an older woman in her mid-thirties on a bed, nude. The woman is posed in a data-expunged position from the viewer's perspective. Dr. identifies the woman as his wife. Dr. attempts to protest this until a photo is produced from Dr. R's wallet, which confirms the identity of the woman in the photo. The guard on staff intervene in the escalation of tempers and inform both doctors to continue with the test. Personal matters will be resolved afterwards. Dr. draws the second photo from SCP-404-A. It is of note that Dr. R's expression was malicious towards Dr. after the previous photo. The photo drawn by Dr. develops into a girl of young age who appears to be in a data expunged pose from the viewer's perspective. This girl is confirmed as Dr. R's daughter, who is data expunged years old. Tension in the room escalates after this photo once more, and the guards on duty step in again. Due to the nature of the photos being drawn, only two more, one from each doctor, are requested. Dr. draws the third photo from SCP-404-A. This photo contains an image of the same girl from the second drawing, nude again, in a new pose. Dr. reluctantly confirms this is in fact his own daughter. Both doctors are calmed down by this event. However, both appear to be extremely uncomfortable and express repeated desires for this test to end. Dr. draws the final photo for this test, which after developing, appears to be Dr. wearing an evening dress. The test is immediately ended by the administering personnel and both doctors placed on notice until the results of this test can be confirmed. A lapse of a full day's time was allowed to pass before either doctor was confronted about the previous day's test results. Neither doctor claims to have any memory of participating in any test, nor any inappropriate behavior with either each other or any of the subjects from the photos. All photos were filed in SCP-404-B and both doctors have been restricted access from SCP-404 from here forward. Continued observation of the doctors from this test show a 6% increase in productivity. This may or may not be related to the loss of the memories exposed in this test. Document number 4045. Subject for this test is a deceased Class D personnel who expired while engaged in testing of SCP- the body of the subject was manipulated by two members of staff in conjunction with medical implements to draw a series of photos from SCP-404-A. First photo drawn develops into a view of SCP at rest. It is assumed this is what the subject saw as the testing of SCP was commencing. Second photo drawn develops into an extreme close-up view of SCP. The nature of this photo suggests that this was the moment at which the subject expired. The right side of the photo is blacked out, as is expected from a scene viewed by a person with a single eye. Third photo drawn develops into data expunged. Test aborted immediately, after viewing of the photo sends the staff manipulating the subject's body into a state of rage. Guards enter the room to control the situation. One guard enters the same state as the research staff and turns on another guard, who is restraining the original test members. Additional armed staff enter area and developed photo is covered by a jacket to prevent further viewing by any other staff. After the events of this test, any further exposure of the deceased with SCP-404 has been expressly forbidden. All staff who were involved in the test were restrained in solitary confinement and after 48 hours were given a psychological evaluation and released. Those who requested amnestics were allowed to utilize them. All photos made during this test were not filed into SCP-404-B 
but were instead sequestered into the care of Dr. and are not to be accessed by any staff without maximum clearance. Item number, SCP-592, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. SCP-592 should be contained in Research Cell 1611-E at all times. Locked in a steel box, in the middle of a frosted glass containment cubicle. Also in the cubicle are a table, two computers, a standard-sized computer scanner, an internal network connection port, and two pairs of visual distortion goggles, which must be worn upon entering the cubicle, so as to make SCP-592 illegible. The first computer serves as an analysis machine, the second as a custom firewall. All devices have been modified with specialized software and hardware, and the network port has been secured such that no device other than the firewall may use it. It is strictly necessary that the computers and scanner are turned off and unplugged after experimenting, and that they are only powered for the duration of the experiment. The front and back covers of SCP-592 are to be covered in black opaque tape at all times. The cell must be guarded continually to ensure that SCP-592 is not removed. Description SCP-592 is a large hardcover book which exhibits no external qualities that could be considered unusual, but which can cause delusions, psychosis, changes in physical health and appearance, or even severe wounding when read. It is titled Chronicle of the 20th Century and consists of 450 all-color printed pages. It is reported that it has a printed cover, no dust jacket, with the title of the book, the publisher, and a selection of illustrations from within the text. The original cover is a deep blue. The spine contains the title and publisher name and is left uncovered by tape. The cover page informs the reader that it was published by Interworld Press, 54 Street, Chicago, Illinois, in 1996. A company named Interworld Press has never been registered in the U.S., nor does the street listed exist. The text is a collection of newspaper clippings and short articles on major events, from January 1900 to December 1995. Much of the first half of the text agrees with recorded events, but at some point no later than the 15th of June 1956, a date researchers have termed the Point of Divergence POD, the text begins to diverge from known history. These divergences become more common and acute the further away from the POD the text is. Subjects reading from the text before the POD report no ill effect, and generally comment that the text is well written and seems very accurately researched. Subjects reading from the book after the POD understand the passage read as accepted truth, and vehemently deny any suggestions that the text is in fact incorrect. The claims subjects make are often disturbing or shocking in nature. It also appears that a subject that has read passages from a certain year can recount events that are detailed in later sections of the book. It has been found that those born before the date which the test passage indicates, and lived in or nearby the location of the event described, may construct personal experiences built around the event, and describe them as they would any other vivid memory. The subject will go to great measures to defend the reality of their story, often turning violent if under interrogation. Exposure to SCP-592 may alter physical characteristics of the subject, to conform with the events of the passage being read. This can vary from small changes in appearance or clothing, to the infliction of severe wounds. For example, in one instance, a subject, D-94920, produced a scar during an interview, stating that he picked it up during the data expunged. His widow, when presented with the scar, located on his was surprised, stating she had not noticed the scar before. It has been found that once the subject discovers that the world is inconsistent with their acquired memories, they begin to feel that the present reality is an illusion, a dream, or a deceit, often stating malevolent or government forces are at work in maintaining the illusion. Subjects who reach this stage enter into a profound and chronic psychosis. All attempts to treat this delusion have failed. The exact effects vary. 
Date of passage read. Before POD. Effects. No ill short or long-term effects. Date of passage read. Less than two months after POD. Effects. Short-term. Confusion. No ill long-term effects. Date of passage read. Less than two years after POD. Effects. Short-term. Confusion. Long-term. Minor mental illness. Development of tics. Nightmares. Minor paranoia episodes. And panic attacks. Date of passage read. Less than ten years after POD. Effects. Short-term. Confusion. Violent episodes. Long-term. Deeply ingrained delusion formed, leading to debilitating paranoia, psychosis, and schizophrenia-type disorders. Date of passage read. Greater than ten years after POD, or earlier, if subject forms a personal experience. Effects. Short-term. Confusion. Violent episodes. Long-term. Acute psychosis and delusions. Crippling agnosia. Becomes withdrawn. High chance of suicidal or homicidal behavior. Severe risk of immediate but variable physical change in subject. SCP-592 was recovered during a narcotics raid in August 2006 on the property of Mr. The leader of a controversial religious group called the Church of the True History. Despite being in possession of SCP-592, Mr. is believed to have started the church for financial gain rather than revelation. The owner may have only survived exposure from SCP-592 for almost two years because of his rampant drug use, which included methamphetamine, cocaine, and a host of opioids. Those psychedelics, especially DMT, are known to have been used and probably interacted with the effects of SCP-592 more than the others. Believed that his delusions came from his drug use, but noted that a year after exposure to SCP-592, he found himself turning to drugs more often to, quote, hide away from the truth, end quote. In custody and deprived of his usual chemical relief, the suspect became comatose and died a week later. The circumstances of the acquisition has led to proposals to test SCP-592 in combination with psychedelic drugs. Addendum 592-A The chemical properties of SCP-592 have been studied by Dr. Grayson and the chemical forensics team. Dr. Grayson reports that Samples were obtained by means of cutting small squares of paper from the book while wearing distortion goggles. The squares were small enough to contain no more than one word. Squares containing portions of illustrations were covered by black opaque tape as soon as extracted. Our results indicate that the chemical properties of SCP-592 differ very little from any other color publication. The paper primarily consists of cellulose from common woods, and the black and yellow inks are standard. It has been found, however, that some chemicals used in the cyan and magenta inks while entirely known to science, are not normally used in the industry. An expert in inks and dyes has commented that the chemicals would be an inferior but acceptable substitute to those currently in use, if certain metal elements were much scarcer, and therefore much more expensive than they are today. Testing Protocol SCP-592 is under no circumstances to be read by a human, unless that person is a subject of an authorized test. SCP-592 is only to be analyzed by computer, using the systems provided. The book is to be scanned on a per-page basis, using the scanner provided. The scanned image is then sent to the analysis machine. The scanner and other devices are modified such that they can be used while wearing the visual distortion goggles. Note: Researchers must pass Training Course 305-S, Intermediate Braille, and Training Course 10-E use of SCP imaging software before being approved to test SCP-592. The analysis machine is modified such that it contains and supports no non-volatile, permanent, writable storage devices, such that it never stores a copy of the scanned image that may persist beyond the analysis phase. 
The image is destroyed from the system RAM as soon as is possible through standard secure memory flushing routines. The firewall is configured to study incoming packets for characteristics of properly processed output and destroys the packet if an insufficient amount of characteristics are discovered. This prevents the transmission of text or images that have not been sufficiently obfuscated. As SCP-592 is heavily illustrated, there are two analysis protocols. Analysis of text. The analysis machine uses industry standard optical character recognition, OCR, systems, to parse the text in the image and then destroys the image. The text file is then passed through a series of custom natural language processing, or NLP, routines, to summarize the text. The original text file is then destroyed and the summary is sent to the secure foundation intranet. The NLP routines analyze the passage using statistical methods, incorporating databases of diverse English corpora, some details of other SCPs, a correct chronology of events extracted from various texts, and a severely limited referential network of other entries in SCP-592. Note. Efforts to increase the degree in which analysis references other events resulted in an incident whereby data expunged, resulting in three researchers being euthanized. See document SCP-592. The summary is composed in such a way as to mitigate any possibility of exposure to the true material of the passage, but still provide useful analytical details about the event described. An example. SCP-592 SUMM 090777A Note: Lexical tokens from source databases are presented in all caps. Date: 7th of September 1977. Location: Southern United States. 99% certainty. Type: Newspaper clipping. Summary: The passage is describing human conflict. The human conflict is of an ideological or religious nature. The passage seems, 56%, to be lamenting in tone. The passage contains the numbers 2000, 1977, and 16. A relation to event SUMM 010777C and event is likely, 78% certainty. It is certain, 98%, that the passage contains a reference to both SCP and SCP related incidents. Incident 592 Loss of a limb following exposure to SCP 592 article on war. Analysis of images SCP 592 contains around 200 illustrations. These are cropped from the scanned image as part of the OCR routine. The image is then subjected to a number of Fourier transforms and convolutions to obscure the resulting output from human recognition, while simultaneously analyzing its structure and providing a summary of its contents by statistical analysis. Record of the original image is then destroyed. An example report, SCP-592 IMG-098 Date, 1st of April, 1963 Location Unknown bedroom with western furnishings. Type Full color photograph. Subject The image contains two adult persons standing, one human child sitting on a chair or stool, and SCP. With 100% certainty, the persons in the image should have facial features. With 100% certainty, the persons in the image do not have facial features. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.